Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapter 71 to 73. I hope that you enjoy. There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, chapter 71. Truth Seeker Cammy had been excited, then she had been merely entertained. That had dwindled down to boredom after about half an hour as Dylan and Anaya argued over the symbols at the door that could be rotated. Four symbols and shapes Cammy had never seen, but dungeons always wrought out the weirdest things. The industrial city called Molomok had made a great progress on taking advanced vices of the dungeon made and figuring out how they worked. Shame that most of the people there were real horrid individuals. They shared their tech, but were often without the manual or instructions. Gemi guessed that they all got a kick out of watching the rest of the world blow themselves up with technology that they didn't understand. The dungeon inventing its own language wouldn't be weird unless it required all who entered to learn the letters and characters to progress. Kemi bit her lip. Would the dungeon be an endless quest of gathering new letters and trying to piece together the words trap or boss? Gonga offered to blow the door open, but Dillum turned another circle. The smallest and innermost symbol was locked, so that the triangle with one side being thicker than the other. It clicked, and the door shuddered and it split in half, and vanished into the frame of the entrance. Cammy stood and clutched at her holy symbol for confidence, as the waft of rich manna and its smells of fresh earth flowed out of the open door. Manna feels funny, tickles the throat. Gonga announced his usual goofy attitude tempered by practice and instincts. Ania smirked. I remember the order. If it doesn't randomize itself, then we can make a fortune selling the code. She announced. Delam nodded, but he motioned for them together. Remember the rules. The party doesn't split. We scout each room before moving on. And the most importantly, watch our words. We don't know how aware the call may be. I'd rather it think that we have an army out here than be hiding something to save ourselves. Dungeons learn. Dungeons grow. Let's not be the scraps that it needs to kill others. He grinned softly. The scholar moons will not fade this day, he promised. The oath, the promise. The words made Kemi beam, and they all repeated them back like words of protection. The guild was a family. Small ones that stayed small often grew closer. That was what Kemi had seen with her own eyes anyway. Dalem led. Kemi was in the rear for support and protection. Ania would mostly space herself out, and Gonga would go where he could blow things up with the most efficiency. A simple party with the basic classes, but more often than not, it was this setup that got the most people to at least the midway point in most dungeons, enough to scout, explore, to be the experts until the bigger guild of fair play arrived. Kemi brushed down the whole white robe as she was the last into the entrance hall. It was an odd scene. Kemi frowned at the tables, the door to the side and the weirdest of all, the small rug of silvery threads surrounded by someone's, uh, rough attempts at making pots. Kemi could see the love put into them, but they're really ugly, Ania announced. Delam was reading some signs and Kemi followed suit. Two tables, two offering bowls, two signs. One had a nice message that Kemi liked. The other, she blinked at a rather rude message. Kemi already knew which bowl that she would be offering to. This core is trying to decide which mindset it likes. Kemi had to ask. Dylan made a noise like he was interested, but also wary. No, it's different words, tones, and even intent. I'm thinking two authors. One has to be the core but nothing else can really make signs in a new dungeon. Could it be like Gemino? He muttered to himself. Gonga snorted. That's one in a million, he argued as he put down a pot that he was holding. The man's rough coat crinkled with a heavy stick they called a staff, but was more akin to a shillach that clunked with a wooden walk. What's Gemino? Gemi asked, interested. Dillam eyed her for a moment. A city with a dungeon to the far east. The core had been damaged early on, but instead of going mad, the damage split out evenly, and it seemed to heal over. 
It resulted in two minds making the dungeon. It was... Dallum frowned as he trailed off. His lips turned into a small frown. A frack up. The floors were a mess, the monster hybrids and the traps non-functional. The calls fought over everything, and everything was split. I heard it finally made it to the tenth floor a while back, Gog amused. If it was a mess, how did it grow? Kemi inquired in confusion. The boss monsters. Yeah, I heard it smashed two monsters together and made a massive mess. Deadly in ways that dungeons with double the floors couldn't match. Every dungeon finds a strength eventually. Gonga scratched his beard. Kemi shivered and tried to imagine a wolf and a goblin slapped together, or maybe a giant snake and a bat. Kemi would avoid that place. Heard of a city fell into civil war that cooled down to a nasty infighting and arguing. Like a city was also split by the dungeon. Ania added her own knowledge. You think this dungeon has a split core? Kemi wondered. Delam shrugged. I think each dungeon has its own surprises. I'm sure we'll find when we reach the core, he explained. His eyes lit up as he said, showing his love for being an adventurer. Kemi admired that about Delam. His calm attitude, but also his deep love for what they did. Ania looked at the door to the side. I thought entrances could only go one way. What is this door? She called, that caused them all to stare at the door. Tradition first, then curiosity. Delam reminded. He held out an object wrapped in a brown cloth to the rude table's bowl. Kemi walked out without hesitation over to the kind-sounding sign and placed her offering in that bowl. It was a tiny carving of her goddess. Kemi hoped that the dungeon didn't mind its roughness. Kemi had cut her fingers more than she cared to admit when making it. She had only picked up the hobby because of how shopping for gifts for a stranger, even a dungeon, made her panic. Making her own gift made the whole act somewhat more personable. May the goddess of truth lead you down the path of true to your heart. Ah, uh, core. Kemi prayed quickly. Ania and Gonga dropped their own wrapped gifts with a bored expression. Had she bit her lip and then blinked and then saw that Delam's offering was his own quiet words at the bowl. Her heart brightened at the sight, not feeling so green and awkward when her own leader was doing the same actions. Kemi, have you got your potions and wards ready? Ania asked bluntly as she fussed over her suddenly while Gonga had his usual task of scanning for traps at the door. Ania fixed Kemi's hair into a professional bun, and Kemi went pink. Ania, I've got this, she insisted, but the older woman still checked her rings and necklaces, each of them infused with minor enchantments. Pricey things that only Delam had one of himself, being the most uh, fragile member. The group had spent their money on making sure Kemi could take a few hits. Besides her own shield of faith, an actual shield was a good substitute. If Kemi didn't feel like hefting a wooden plank about, magical shields did good for a while. Too much force and arrow traps or even monster attacks and her expensive novice-made shields would drop. Not that Kemi planned on being near those or close to things capable of doing such. Thor's fine, should we investigate this memorial? He asked of Delam, pointing to the words above the door. There was a brief pause before he nodded. Usual entrance method, he ordered, and Ian Gorga took up a spot near the middle of the room. Kemi moved to the side, and Dillam crouched, ready to roll, to the side if he reached the door handle. If something did try to ambush or pull Dillam in, then he would dodge, and Ian and Gongo would make the thing dead, and if that wouldn't go exactly to plan, Kemi would bless and shield where she could. She knew that she lacked the proper mindset for smiting. The door opened and Delam rolled. Nothing happened. Ania lowered her bow. Her thick leather hood making the confusion hard to see, but not the way that her body seemed to freeze. Well, look at that. Gonga said as he walked casually into the room, eyes sweeping the floor and the walls for obvious low-level traps that would be expectant of a dungeon this young. Nothing. Names on stone. What killed them? When? Delam pointed out as he walked into the room. It wasn't cold like a mausoleum or a tomb, but the air held a crisp feeling of acute sadness. They all looked up at the statue of a woman. Her long dress, like skirt, halted around her shoes. 
her oddly silk-like shirt and necklace that seemed to reach down to her stomach, the way that her hair only slightly framed her face. Kemi looked at the details and took it in. This was a fine, but it was the face. The sheer utter sadness on the statue's face as it stared at them, as if to see into their souls. It asked one simple question, and it broke Kemi's heart. Why? Why did they need to die? She had to leave the room as the others probed for hidden passages or secrets. Kemi didn't want whatever hidden wealth that room had. Not if she had to carry the gold or treasure out from under that look. Kemi prayed. Kemi prayed that she and her family would not end up on that wall. For her sake, and the woman who of the statue was inspired by, she had a feeling both of them would grieve such a loss. Do you think that they'll be all right? Dabagos asked as she sipped her mint spirit. Chris shrugged. They know what they're doing, I think. I'm more worried about Delta, the fire mage argued. Deary, those people are greener than my exploding cabbages. Dabagos said simply, Chris could see that. So, the dungeon is actively trying not to kill them. They'd have to be special kind of stupid to die down there. He said with a snort. Oh... But what if they upset her? Delta is a delicate flower, and I have to admit that I've grown to like her a bit more than the average human. The woman giggled, Chris eyed her over. If they come out with some kills under their belt, you aren't allowed to kill them for it in return. He reminded the druid, Dabagos licked her lips as she finished her drink. Kill? No, no, my dear peacekeeper. I have much longer punishments in mind, but I assume those would still be off limits as well. My guardian could use some exercise. The woman pouted before she grinned. Maybe I can sneak some shrieking violets into their room. She mused aloud, Chris actually laughed at that. If you wish to make Madame Goose in look impolite, do feel free, he offered, and Dabagast pursed her lips. Hmm, I'd rather not bring out the old grave for protection. Very well, but you must at least let me nag them to tug some ears. I have been told my lectures would make trees full with one thousand demon souls that turn into rude giants quiver. She almost pleaded. You need to stop telling Jones that you'd love to stuff him into your trees. That man is actually looking nervous. Quiss didn't exactly answer. But Quiss, my dear, I'm only three off of the thousand souls in my favorite tree, came the complaint. He was sure, almost, that she was joking. Chris sipped on his drink harder and wondered how the new blood would deal with the spiders. Horribly, he assumed. Should we do the challenge? The question came from Kemi, and the other three gave her a look. Sweetie, we don't do extra work when the work is already to tall order. And he explained and gestured at the webbed room. Once we map out the simple dangers and know where everything is, then we can add the extra excitement. She explained. Kemi saw how that made sense. The box was closed and they all declined. Kemi blinked for a moment and the box looked like it was adding new text. It must have been her jittery nervous tension making her see things. What kind of danger do we have? She asked an Anya who was an expert of natural traps. Spiders being the obvious, venom and such. But Kem, what do you see? The woman encouraged her to look again. Kemi blinked and her nerves shot through the roof. Shh, it's not a test. You've been working hard. I know you can do this. Ania soothed her panic with a wink. I wouldn't have any other priestess at my back. You're my rising star, she added casually. The praise from Ania was a rare treat, and Kemi beamed. She turned to the room and gave it a hard look. Some of the webs might be linked to traps, or they might be trip wires. The fruits in the middle look too obvious. I wonder if they're poisonous. The web itself looks weird. Not normal. She listed after a moment. Missed potential hidden pressure plates and the clearer sections. And the fact that the bush itself has hide monsters, but you did good. Ania said, softly pushing Kemi's nose. Yeah, I'm not a kid. The priestess said, hiding her smile. Do we risk it? Dalim cut through the shared smile with a back to business. Nah. Stand back. Gonga yawned as his hands began to smoke. The berries can be collected later. Our goal is to get as far as we can before anyone else. He reminded them all there was a beat of silence. Gonga, maybe we should be a little more careful. 
Cammy offered before the blast of fire roared out in the man's hand and swallowed the webs, the tree, the spiders, the room. The heat was not the greatest, but it was enough to reduce everything to a black ash. The smoke curled around Abbot Gonga, easily used a contrap spell to collect the smoke into a solid black marble that he threw down the hall, where it exploded into smoke. Gemi couldn't complain. Breathing in fumes was bad for one's lungs. That was just the truth. They slowly walked in, and here, carefully checking for pressure plates that they wouldn't be affected by the fire. Gonga looked proud of his work. A little fire, and done. Really, we should blow more stuff up if it's going to be this easy. Nature dungeons are my forte. He bragged. Gemi frowned. The room had looked pretty, the tree most of all. It had looked like a reward to her, but she was still learning. That was when something very odd sounded out. A collection of piano notes sounded out in a very sly jingle. What? Gonga? looked shocked, and Ia, who had a bow, raised in an instant, and the music was soon flowing by a smooth voice. I think it's time for a date. The almost girlish voice sang, where was it coming from? There was when Dalem's fist smacked into Gonga's chin. A shocked silence took over, except for the music and the words. It is time for a spider dance. The girl's voice laughed. Gonga, I didn't. Dalem tried to explain, but his foot rose so suddenly that he tried to kick the man. What the hell? Delam, have you lost your mind? Gonga demanded. Ania suddenly spun on her toes with a yelp as her foot shot out and hit Gonga in the rear. W -w -w what? My body is moving on its own, she yelled. It's time for the spider dance. All under her spell should look up. The girl's singing voice turned deep into a mirthful chuckle of a man for a moment running alongside the female lyrics. Kemi felt her own body move, then fearing the worst, she blinked as she was pulled up into the air and put into some setting position to watch the show. She saw that her wrists and torso had been wrapped in a very thin wire that had been almost impossible to see in the dim room. She followed the wires to the source, looking up and up, until she saw it. The white translucent spider, much larger than any other that she had ever seen, stared down at her. The glowing red eyes twinkled, the eight legs twitched wildly, and her friends spun and twitched as they continued to assault Gonga with playful attacks. The madam of the first room, Lady Muffet invites her guests to dance. The voice sang and Kemi could see the small mushroom near the corner of the room buzzing as the voice sang. Kemi, are you all right? Ania yelled as her head tried to look behind her. Her body rose like a dancer on strings. Yes, there's some ghost spider pulling your strings, uh, webs, she called. Psh, enough of this, Gonga yelled, and his free hand shot another fireball at the white spider. Muffet, was that its her name? The heat and the flames engulfed the spider. The strings went slack and all three of her friends sagged with relief. Fires solve everything. Gonga grinned triumphantly. Kemi wanted to cheer or say something, but her mind snagged on a little detail. Kemi's web hadn't given or sagged. Gonga, you've just made it mad, she screamed. Gonga turned with confusion, but the large man was hefted off the ground and dropped twice. As Ania and Dalim were put aside like toys, the spider no longer had interest in. Gonga was yanked hard from side to side as one of his feet was hoisted into the air. He began to spin faster and faster as the spider, uh, Muffet, emerged from the smoke untouched. The mushrooms buzzed again. With legs like those, who needs a physical body? The voice teased. Gonga was yelling and cursing so much that Kemi was shocked to find a pair of earmuffs made of a silvery web lowered onto her head. She touched them gently, noticing how she was trapped but not tightly bound. It was when Muffet, the ghost spider, began to hold the man still. It looked like the punishment was going over until it was very tightly twisted web began unwind. The reversing speed spun her friend so much faster than before. She had a bad feeling as the screaming turned to groaning. From what she could hear anyway, these earmuffs were really well made. A perfect size. 
That's when Gonga threw up and Kemi heard a distant scream from deep within the dungeon. Muffet was ready to do more but Amiya managed to loose the arrows and hit the thin wire like a pro. Gonga dropped and he lay there for a moment. I think we should regroup and leave for a moment, Kemi suggested. Muffet looked at her, crawling closer. Kemi felt her face go pale before the spider patted her head. Then the web vanished and Muffet seemed to melt into the shadows. That was apparently ghost spiders for, of course you will, silly human. Delam and Anaya dragged Gonga back and the man stumbled to his feet. What the hell was that? he demanded. Kemi lowered her earmuffs to her neck and looked sheepish as they all stared at her. I got a consolation prize. Do they exist in dungeons? she asked with the brightness. The lack of answers made her twilt just a tad. Gonga's lead the way back. I had that, just needed time to make the flame funnel spell work. He said with some hurt pride and a lingering nausea. Kemi wasn't going to point out the lack of spiky objects in the room for Muffet to swing him into. Gonga was getting his morale back when each excuse, and he grinned before long. Let's plan and get revenge, he said with a boastful laugh. That was when he screamed and fell over in shock as the sign of all things popped out of the wall. It was clearly the back of the sign, but there was still text. Was Muffet too much for you? No. Kemi slowly put the earmuffs back on as the cursing began again. They were warm. Kemi wondered if placing an offering to the specific monster in a dungeon was allowed. She hoped that the dungeon wouldn't mind. Kemi looked back at the blackened room. And, had to be honest, both as a follower of the Goddess of Truth and as a kind person that she was, Dungeon 1, Scarlet Moons, 0. Still, she got a treasure. That had to count for something. Rudy blinked three times, a kiss, very slowly. You mean to tell me that some new hero wannabes are in Delta's place, setting stuff on fire and killing everything? Rudy asked, nostrils flaring as her hangover came in heavy. Quis and Dambagar shared a look. Delta has very good defenses. Quis began, but Rudy picked him up by his shirt. Delta is my friend. The girl who craps out monsters but turns them into gold. The person who made me a fishing spot. The girl who doesn't want to kill and slapped you down like a bitch when you pushed. That Delta, it doesn't matter if she can fend them off. I'm not going to sit here and let people torment her. She growled. You can't stop the world from coming. Chris said calmly, despite his feet dangling off the ground. Rudy grinned darkly. No, but I sure as hell can stop the first million. She stated and dropped Chris as she turned to walk back out of the village. If she takes the first load, I could always do another couple million on a bad day. Dabagast helped Quiss to his feet, ignoring the hot glare that he was giving off. She is a dungeon. We can't protect her from her own existence. He said hotly. Dabagast shrugged. Who is it for anyone to decide who Delta is? I think that's just rude. The woman said kindly and left Quiss alone in front of the pub. I know, but... We aren't doing her any favors by sheltering her. Nothing wrong with Delta learning how to deal with people. He mused slowly to himself. Honestly, they were acting like if Kuss had seen a real monster heading towards Delta, he wouldn't have stopped it. He was preparing for the long term. He walked after Ruli, his body becoming a blue ball of fire, a tiny wisp in the forest as he easily overtook Ruli's angry stomping pace. He'd give these fellows, these Scarlet Moon folks, a decent chance at Delta's place. Now, he had to do it without Ruli breaking his jaw. The group slowed as they bypassed the spider room, as they called it, since they hadn't left the dungeon. It hadn't had the chance to respawn its contents. They were wary of Muffet. Soon they found themselves before a large pond beyond the intersection. Anya's eyes lit up with the fish swimming about as Delam investigated the logs and the potential campfire that he could make of them. Kemi was smiling at the glowing mushroom and the moss on the ceiling. She didn't see Gonga eyeing the black dog snoozing in the tiny alcove. Nor did she see Gonga licking his lips. 
Gemi really wished that she had afterwards, because the challenge pockets appeared too late, as if to punish them for closing it last time prematurely. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 72. Inferno at the Grove. It had been quite a sight. They all sat around the tiny, crackling fire that Della made out of the logs nearby, as if they were put there just for that purpose. They might as well have been. Hania felt this place was uh, different. A new dungeon often felt like a hazard, a mine left to be filled with monsters or tiny tower of a few floors of traps. She had stared at the bottom like the rest of the moons, but she had grown up raised on battle stories, not that they were handed to her. Little Annie, fetch me another drink. I'm telling your brother about the time I wrestled a bear on the last trip. Aye, you can't say that to her. She's a wee lass. She's going to take over the place. Annie hasn't shown any interest in anything. Annie, I know that you wanted to go on that trip, but your brother... She eyed the fish that she had been nibbling, despite her being one of the clear them safe and a subspecies of the local fish. There had been some unique fish in the pond. Ania didn't dare to fish for them. She didn't know the rules. Would catching them turn on some hidden timer? Would it make them fight something like a muffet spider? Ania couldn't risk it. She wouldn't risk her team when they wanted to relax. Not Dillum, not Conger, not Kami. She eyed the young girl as she fiddled with the earmuffs, her own fish already gone. Kemi was a wonderful girl. It made sense. Ania handed her stick over to the girl. These fish taste terrible. Kemi, you can take this, she huffed. It took all the wool to give up the food, but Kemi looked unsure before she beamed at Ania. Thank you, but are you sure you won't go hungry? Kemi pressed. Ania snorted aloud. Kemi, hun, I know how to conserve energy and to supply with waters for weeks. Eat the fish. She turned to face the pond to cut off the arguments. Her stomach protested, but the tight leather armor that she wore was a good muffler. Kemi hadn't been eating much last night at the inn. The village had spooked her too much, and Ania knew the girl would not waste a gift, even if it was a slightly chewed fish. Ania was a fighter. She could have lost the journey until they got back. If worse comes to worse, she would catch another fish when they weren't looking. For now, she set her face into the confident smoke that put Kemi at ease when their eyes met again. She watched Gonga patrol around the pond, his curiosity mostly drawn to the duck at the far end on the body of water. The pond room was nice. It wasn't uncommon for dungeons to have places of beauty. Something about what mankind couldn't own and build on gave them a hidden, mysterious vibe. Ania knew that even most famous of the explored dungeons, there were most likely some hidden pockets of mystery that the dungeons kept from them. The ceiling was covered in glowing moss that made it look like the twinkling sea of stars that had snuck in the entrance with them. Soft grass grew in patches, odd rocks made of good seats, and the lapping of the fish broke what could have been a creepy silence. The duck was the oddest fixture, and honestly, Ania was getting bad vibes from the thing. However, as she stared at the creature, something caught her eye. She stood and went to stand close to Gonga. Is that a key? She pointed to the hook set onto the wall above the duck's alcove. Gonga narrowed his expression before nodding. Looks like it. What do you think? Trap, he asked, eyes never moving. Ania pursed her lips and she slightly moved back and forward. By trying to avoid traps last time, we set off another trap or penalty. Fishing didn't set off anything off, but maybe going for the duck could be a trap. Be happy with fish and don't eat the duck kind of thing, she suggested. Gonga frowned. I'm not the most... In the no guy, but this dungeon is kind of thinking ahead, and that spider ain't no common mob or trap. He grunted. Ania had to agree with that. Gonga nodded at the pond. Water is super rich in mana. All my energy is back after eating that fish. A dungeon with a mana spring that has things living inside of it that aren't monsters. That's pretty odd, Gonga added. Ania blinked, returning her gaze to the water. Gonga was right. Mana rich environments made monsters, or the chance of them to appear, rise vastly as a rule of thumb. 
the dungeon should have no trouble changing these fish into lethal creatures if it wanted. If it wanted. The dungeon kept the harmless fish, she noted, and then looked around this area to the other odd feature that seemed to crop up for more after the spider room. The mushrooms. Different colors and shapes, and a few of them seemed to uh, glow like the stars that appeared in a thin cage. Ania had not been confident enough at her poisonous fungi law to risk eating them. She was much better at hunting than foraging. Could be a special case. Dungeons are never the same. What is one shown so far? Ania muttered to herself. This was something she prided herself in, being able to think and see things. Any decent adventurer that became a dungeon wanderer knew that the key to adventuring into the unknown was seeing the signs. So Anya tried to understand what they had seen. The spider room had a tiny potentially deadly spiders and the tree with berries near the center, as if to show a reward. Gongas burning it had made something worse appear. This dungeon worked on a bad behavior, punishing the idea of sins? It had a beautiful nature and did not react when Anya fished for what was needed. Was it against greed? Against human nature to ruin whatever mystery that they stumbled upon? Two rooms wasn't enough for Anya to readily read the signs, let alone predict behavior. Though the actual signs around the place in and of themselves were weird. Either the young dungeon had been spurned and hurt by people not liking its uh, theme, or was already more aware than the two forward should be, and it had its own ideas. Living close to Durant's, Anya couldn't discard either theory just yet. Gonga grabbed the key. Denim called as he carefully put out the fire. As the flames died down, the atmosphere seemed to feel a little less stressful, less magical, almost. Gonga grinned. If some squid comes out of the water and grabs me, do that cool arrow trick for me. Gonga winked at Anya. She rolled her eyes. Try not to cause two disasters in less than an hour, she retorted, but then her hand rested on her bow to show that she wouldn't let him down. The giant of a man peeled off his shirt and robe to reveal a heavily toned torso. Gonga was no library dust bunny. Anya knew the man would be deadly with an axe or a spear, but she also knew Gonga. So, as Kemi picked up his clothes, Anya notched an arrow just to be ready. She could almost see the bottom of the pond, but who knew what could be just under the sand? One monster might just look like a rock. Honestly, Anya wanted to know what the deep blue glowing rock near the back of the pond was. It looked like a fallen star that pulsed with a navy light. Gonga slowly waded in, and then he swam over to the alcove. Anya followed the progress with the arrow knocked tight. Her fingers were ready. She had held the pose for much longer, under much worse circumstances. Nothing could touch Gonga without feeling her sting. Please watch over him, Kemi prayed. Nothing would make Kemi's heartfelt words become wasted. Gonga sat on the edge of the alcove and plucked the key without any issues. The duck next to the large frame looked smaller than ever. Gonga grinned and patted the duck. The thing opened one red eye, and Ania felt her heart drop into her stomach. Think this little fella would like a nice supper or a mascot. He called over and slipped into the water, splashing the duck as he caused a slight wave. The duck opened both eyes, and his head slowly turned to look at Gonga's back. Kemi suddenly began to shake as the duck's shape became blurry, almost leaving a dark orb with deep red eyes. Gonga glowed with a similar dark red aura for a moment. Anya felt unsure what to do. Shooting the thing was the most obvious answer, but Gonga had upset it first. It didn't exactly feel like it rated an arrow to the beak. Gonga didn't even seem to notice the effect, but he suddenly went pale for a moment before he howled. He reached out and pulled himself onto the dry land, where he batted of some of the small that was tiny claw that snipped into Gonga's. Ania looked down at her feet in a thin expression. Her heart slowed down for a more normal beat as Gonga was screaming as some little crayfish tried to remove his ability to have kids. Kemi screeched and began trying to kick it off in a panic which seemed to do far more damage than the crayfish. The duck watched the scene as it preened. 
Yeah, and Eo is keeping her arrows away from that thing. Dillum just watched this all with wide eyes. A single box appeared before Gonga. They all bent down to read it as the man curled up to stop Kemi from helping him. Finish the dungeon under the Dark Drake's curse. Dillum mumbled, Dark Drake. They all looked at the duck, which was still looking at them. The red eyes invited them to incur his wrath as well. I am cursed, Gonga said after a moment. Curses. Anya's threat rating of this dungeon went from a four out of six to run away. Magic was not her expertise, and even Anya knew how a curse required so much magic that it affected someone's life every moment. The power to sustain such a curse was monstrous, both in reasoning and the required amount of energy. Kemi bent down and had one hand grasping the amulet around her neck. Kemi, don't push yourself. Anya warned, but the girl was muttering already. Goddess above, hear my plea. Strike this trick from this man. Heal his woes from trouble. She prayed the young woman's body became infused with a golden aura. The power of the goddess of truth surged through Kemi, and her eyes snapped open, and the golden light swallowed Kemi's normally sweet expression. A priestess of truth had taken Kemi's place. The tone of a friend became authoritative and commanding. I banish the curse, I free you, Kemi yelled, and her power surged. A ripple of gold rove over Gonga. The black aura rose once more from Gonga's skin to fight back against the light, to see her friend fooled with the goddesses of power, always sent a shiver down Amia's spine. This was different than Gonga's throwing fire about and he's bouncing an arrow off the trees blindfolded. This power was dangerous. To be a priest, a war priestess, would be their instrument of this world. A frail, young girl like Kemi could be a judge, a jury, and executioner if the power of her faith was strong. It changed Kemi whenever she used it. The golden aura bathed over the dark one, but there was a ripple before the dark shadow totally faded. It seemed to crack and Kemi was knocked on her rear. The trance fading and the holy power left Kemi's body. Gonga's curse, whatever it was, looked much weaker, but it remained. I, Kemi, order you to s stop dancing. The girl mumbled as she stared up at the ceiling with distant eyes. Is she all right? Gonga stood and winced as sparks of faith washed over his skin and they failed to find any devotee. The same as always when she used too much power. Give her a minute. Dalim said calmly and he put his jacket under Kemi's head. Please don't pet anything or set anything else on fire. Without permission, Amia turned to Gonga. The large man nodded. This place is scary. He agreed on his own. This dungeon was bizarre, scary, and not a place that should be giving them trouble from the levels that it supposedly had. We should leave it for the day, Amia stated, and Kemi slowly came around. Kemi will be fine and Gonga will listen a little better from now on. Every day we stall, the more likely the news will spread. If we can at least find the boss room, we can hold a seniority for a while. Delam disagreed, his tone held understanding or worry, but his eyes seemed to be focused on something else. There'll be other dungeons, something that can curse, she began, but Delam put a hand on her shoulder. This dungeon is all scary stuff. When you don't respect it, every room, every scrap of info can push us ahead in the game. This curse, knowing what it gives us, is an edge. He reminded her and then seemed to smile. And you know, if you try to leave because Kemi used her power, she'd be upset, he added. This was annoyingly true. She watched the duck as the others left the room. It looked far more awake. It was watching Kemi. Ania glowered at it. Touch her and I'll serve you on a skewer. She growled into the room. She fully expected it to try and curse her or glare back, but it merely ruffled its feathers and began to swim around in slow circles. Whoever gave this dungeon such a beast, Anya was going to punch him. Quis watched as Rudy picked herself up from the ruined tree that she had been punted through. Can you stop between you, the lumberjack, and now us? Durance is going to run out of trees and Davagos will get all pissy. He called, the red-eyed and snarl with the answer that he got. Quiz blinked, and a shield of white flames made the woman sidestep and give him a point to finger at her. 
You're beginning to annoy me. He warned and Rudy side-kicked the shield so hard that it went up in smoke. Move, before I use you to beat people up, Rudy growled. Quiz sighed the blackened area and the odd pieces of glass that had been dirt and soil. The crushed rocks were Rudy's fault and Quiz could stick to that story. They're just harmless kids. Well, young adults. They gotta experience dungeons. You can't keep the dungeon to yourself. He tried to reason. You sound like my mother when I brought home a chimera. I won't remove them. I'll just watch them so that I don't freck it up. That's good, right? Knowing how not to freck up? She tried to grin, but her demon fangs were a little longer than usual due to her frustration. I don't think dragging them about and hitting them until they agree not to do anything is helping. Quiz answered dryly. Okay, make you a deal. If we both go to the dungeon, you can stop me stopping them from freaking up. She really nodded. Demon energy made this woman so much more pig-headed than normal. I don't want to go back in the dungeon. It's been three days since I was there, and I really, really don't want to see what Delta has done now. A few new touches, a couple of pets, no big deal. But what's this? Delta might have done something to her storeroom, Quiz said hotly. Annie had turned the key on the door, which opened to a wide space with many shelves. The table of food nearby invited him to a feast as barrels laid about, filled with novice arrows and other items. Interesting room, but she couldn't see why the key was guarded by the duck. Speaking of, Kemi gently petted the duck as it rested in her arms. The damn thing had tricked Kemi into thinking it was sorry. Kemi also had the willpower of a wet piece of bread when it came to animals. Short of throwing the duck away and making Kemi cry, Amia had to deal with it. She moved near the shelves and saw jars of honey, bundles of dried flowers, more odd pots, a couple of pig iron swords and shields. It was a mix and match of potential useful things and maybe junk like the apple and the candy bar. It was a little odd. Could be trapped, Dallum offered. Ania didn't see any wires or pressure plates. Magically, she had no clue. Mr. Duck, what do you think? Kemi asked brightly, and the duck eyed the room. It quacked once. Mr. Duck doesn't think so, Kemi announced. Ania blinked once, very slowly. Kemi, we've been over this. The talking cat you met that one time in town was an exception, not the rule. You can't speak to animals. She reminded. Kemi looked sad, but the duck quacked again. This cheered Kemi up. Ducks are so cute, she smiled. Not that duck. But Amia was getting distracted. Gonga was fishing in a barrel for root, but Dallum was hovering near the feast table, where another box was open. Ania looked at Dallum, who was eyeing it. I know that we should take things slow, but this thing says that we have to catch something called Mary. No fail condition. Could be easy and add some treasure under our belt, he mused. Anania looked around the room. That didn't sound so bad. With no protest from the searching Gonga, who had a wooden helmet fall on his head, and be distracted by Kemi, who was still talking to the duck, Dallum accepted the challenge. That was when the mouse appeared. Quiss was a little pressed for options. His usual idea would be to blow the area to little bits and being close to Durance and Dalta. He had to be reasonable. He watched as Rudy wrestled with a giant flame serpent that drooled molten slag. That should at least buy him a few minutes. He pulled out a flask and took a deep drink. If he got drunk enough, he'd stop caring about everything so much and feel better. Until then, he watched Rudy rip her way through the snake's stomach with a howl of victory. That was when it split into a bunch of smaller snakes, and Quiz took another sip. There was a beep, and the mouse vanished with a cheeky wave. Annie watched this as she felt the honey from the jars in her hair. Gonga was buried somewhere under the fallen shelves and the apples and pots. Dellum had ended up hiding under the feast table, and Kemi watched with wide eyes as oddly everything in the room fell short of her stopping at the door, or it was strewn around her in a lucky streak. The duck, which was fast asleep in her arms, still managed to look smug. I might have been a little haste, Dellum began, but Annie's furious gaze silenced him as a splat of honey fell onto her boots. The shell seemed to 
be tipped backwards mostly and made the back wall of the place untouchable due to the sheer mess. Lucky for them, it fell that way and not the other way. Amaya slammed the door shut and locked it after shoving the party members out of the damn room, throwing the key down the hall with a snarl. She led the way down the hall, looking for traps, as only the other way soon led to a new room that made Anya's rising temper reach levels that caused even the duck to stare at her. Mud, she hissed. Chris picked himself up as he sighed at the flask, now empty. That wasn't even close to getting him sloshed. He watched as Rudy cracked the small fire snake like a whip as she advanced on him. It reminds me of a few nights of me and you got frisky. Rudy snarled, but her eyes were alight with excitement. Quiz sniffed as he snapped his fingers, making the weapon vanish. Yeah, I was thrown through a wall then as well. Quiz remembered. The sad fact was that Rudy focused destruction had an edge over Quiz's area denial powers. She could keep punting him towards Delta, and Quiz wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Well, he could. He just didn't want to. Rudy, are you calming down yet? He called, and the growing horns on her head answered that. Well, that left Quiz with a few options, didn't it? His hands held a single spark of fire, and it turned silver. Rudy froze. Y you're using that? She asked, taking a step back. Quiz smiled with a raised eyebrow. Not yet, but I can, he admitted. Rudy's eyes narrowed, her clawed hands balled up into fists. I ain't no tree, I can take a few hits, she warned. And the almost bored air suddenly turned to harsh as the two friends looked at each other. The demonic shadow with glowing red eyes that seemed dim all light, and around her and the face off against a man whose skin was slowly being covered by silvery veins that almost reached his eyes. Oi! The word caused them both to pause. They turned to see Haldi, walking up the path with a sullen young man at his side. You two knocked that off. Friends should be drinking together, or having unexplored romantic tensions over the course of an adventure, not wantingly blowing up the landscape. The elder man chided. The silence made Quiz want to groan, but Rudy cleared her throat. Haldi, I can't romance Quiz. I need a warm bed and passion, not a wet blanket and a lecture, she huffed. And I need someone who isn't a psycho, Quiz stated bluntly, which Rudy took no offense to, as she almost agreed with him. Ah, young love, isn't that right, Fromage? Aldi asked the young companion. The man looked at them and Quiz, and he could swear that he almost heard a sad breeze of all things. I have never known love. The man pushed his hair to the side and gazed in deep pain at that moment. Quiz blinked. We got some nice ladies who'd be up for it. A few men too, but they can be a bit weird, Rudy offered. The man seemed to struggle for a moment. Fromage came to visit me. He's a friend of a friend. He tends to, uh, do things. Haldi acutely frowned, which was weird coming from the man. Defy expectations, Fromage said. His hair doing some weird thing that wind didn't exist. We're off to the dungeon, Haldi explained. We're got a greenhorn there. Might not be the best time. Quiz announced. Haldi's face froze for a moment before he smiled again. So soon. Thought we'd have more time. Oh well. Come on, Fro. Another day. He said in the eye the two of them. You should let the kids have their fun. Nothing ruins a good adventure like a mother hen. The white-haired man suggested, eyeing Rudy in particular. Rudy looked aghast at the idea that she would either care or be responsible. Quiz was fine being a stick in the mud and going home if he never had to cross the stupid mud room again. Fromage looked in the direction of the dungeon. Our fate will bring us together. Soon, he called. Quiz had no idea how someone could speak in italics with words without air quotes, but the young man had managed it. He's a worse nerd than you. Rudy grumbled, her eyes darted to Dalta's dungeon and the distance, and a touch of concern actually showed. Go home, Rudy. I've got to make sure that they aren't breaking any laws and all of that. Chris sighed, knowing full well what he was going to regret this. A paw stretched on for a long moment. Thanks. Just make sure Dalta is all right. Next round is on me, Rudy said, eyes averted as she followed Holdy back to town. Chris gave her a huge back a strange look. Weird woman, he grumbled. 
He'd take a nap outside, and if the group wasn't back in an hour, Chris would pop his head in. That seemed fair. Not a lot could go wrong in an hour. Everything was going wrong. Annie watched in dismay as Kemi cheerfully jumped to her left and not Annie's, making it a cross that had been easy enough for her nimble form. But the others... Gonga dripped with mud at her side while Delam was untouched. Kemi was about to fall forward into the mud as the platform of the room tilted dangerously. The motion caused a wave in the mud to bounce back off the wall and lifted the platform up with an oddly focused force. Kemi let out a scream as she was sent flying clear to the other side. Amia could only stare in shock and surprise as the girl had crashed into her. The last thing that she saw was a smug duck on the other side, watching this unfold before it turned and waddled back to its pond room. Then she saw the ceiling. Whoa, that was some good luck. You nearly crashed into the wall. Gonga praised. Delam helped Kemi up and Ania just lay there, exhausted after four rooms. This dungeon was murder on her nerves. She reached under her back and hoped that the pointy thing sticking out of the other angle wasn't her spine. A broken arrow from her quiver dangled loosely between her fingers. Amia was both relieved, and yet, this arrow annoyed her more than the rat, the duck, the spider, or the mud. Ania guessed that this is one of those last straw things that she had heard so much about. I hope that we see Mr. Duck before we leave. Gemi chatted to tell him as he opened up the wooden door leading into the small corridor. The wet earthly smell was actually stronger than that side of the door. Considering Anya had just dealt with a pit of mud, this wasn't something that she wanted to smell. The number of mushrooms in the hall was almost worrying. This place lacked mushrooms or something. Delam led the way and soon the answer became abundantly clear. This dungeon loved mushrooms. The wide open forest space before them did not have trees or flowers but mushrooms that brushed the ceiling as clusters of different mushrooms gathered like bushes or thick walls hiding anything in the shadows. Kemi looked up and she slowly spun. I've never seen a mushroom so big. She gasped in delight. Ania lightly tugged her away from the standing underneath one of the tree-like mushrooms. Being covered in spores or poisonous dust would be a bad thing. I'm keeping my hands in my pockets here, Gonga muttered. Those words were nice to hear. Some of these fungi looked odd. Several black ones looked oily, which were the cause for concern. Some species I near just didn't know, but nothing in nature turned black was usually good. Other mushrooms were some of those odd ones that had grown stalks inside the gap that made them look like stars. Denim eyed the space as he carefully tread forward. Something smells good. He blinked in confusion. He bent down to peer at the mushroom that looked like a stalk was made out of golden butter and had pepper sprinkled over the cap. I never knew mushrooms could smell good uncooked. Gonga blinked. Kemi tugged on Amiya's arm. Look at that one, she said, and Amiya's eyes landed on the most common sight in the grove, a mushroom with a pale white cap that looked soft like silk. A green light shined from under the cap as the edge of the cap grew in tiny little threads. Underneath the mushroom, the earth looked rich. Kemi carefully bent down, and Anya spoke softly as to not make any immobile mushroom run away. I saw a herb like that. It gave off a green light, and its leaves were like silk bandages. But that's an aid of breath, a herb. She said, and Kemi waved a hand over the mushroom. A slight golden power flickered in her fingers. It's nice. I think... I don't think it's hiding anything evil. Kemi announced as she plucked it with a smile. The problem was that the sight of a mound of earth where the mushroom grew had shuddered as Kemi began to struggle to yank it free. Kemi, back away. She warned, but Kemi's strength proved to be the winner as she stumbled back with the mushroom in her hands. The slight popping noise was loud. The dirt before Ania shuddered violently and began to rise. The brown earth shifted to reveal not actually dirt or a mound, but an unamused face of a big and now awake boar. The mushroom Kemi had young free had been uh, growing on the boar's rump. The boar eyed the broken stalk where the mushroom had been sprouting from. I didn't mean it, the young girl offered. 
Amiya was going to shoom, snorting nostrils and stamping feet meant that yanking a growing mushroom off of its body probably hurt. The ball gave a huge thump forward, and the running speed of Amiya was worried about began to build up. Amiya reached down and yanked her friend to her feet. Back to the door, she barked the order out as she ran the other way, trying to draw the monster's attention. It mostly worked. The addition of Delam and Gonga rushing in helped too. The ball charged at her, and Ania's fiddlings with the arrow nearly caused her to be rammed through with the tusk of the ball lowered as its head the last minute and head-butted her through some mushrooms instead. Amania saw dancing caps as her vision swam for a second as her head rattled. Her chest and back protested against her moving too much. Ignoring that, she found her bow and arrows and saw Delam being savagely kicked away with a single hoof. Her leader rolling hard as he had the wind knocked out of him. Delam! Kemi yelled as she grasped her amulet, but Anya knew her remaining use of the goddess's power was low. She hoped that the girl saved her for a much needed heal if it came up. Longer roared as his staff wedged the boar slightly up, and the animal did something very odd. Its head, which was near the ground, reached over and snagged one of the glowing mushrooms that looked like the star with its tongue. Ania was about to take a shot, but the boar's eyes lit up in a magical manner and the damn thing fired lasers from its eyes. Gonga, thankfully, was knocked back rather than burned to a crisp, but the mage of the group yelled as a black mark on his chest burned where he had been hit. The arrow flew true and struck hard into the back leg of the boar. It howled and turned a furious glare her way. But she took a risk and climbed the mushroom for some space. She'd take some toxins over being gored to death. Her tree was knocked so violently as the boar crashed into it, and Amaya had to jump to another one quickly. Another arrow was shot in a hurry as she landed, but it landed in a thick hide, doing almost nothing. Get back to the entrance, both of you, Gonga screamed, holding his staff. Let us try before you resort to more explosions. Delam ordered. The large mage nodded quickly, not arguing with the leader. Delam pulled out a long sword that was almost blended into the drab clothes he wore. Gonga, lend me your power, he asked. Hania kept leading the boar on a chase as she led it from mushroom to mushroom, peppering her arrows into it. It was nothing more than a distraction, but Anya knew the plan when she heard it. Gongus chanted loudly, and instead of the mushy fire that Gonga favoured, he waved his hands over Delam, and the man's sword was covered in a shimmering blue flame. When Delam swung it, with a quick test, it left behind a blur of blue in its wake. Gonga had a rather firm grasp on the basics of fire. Enchanting weapons was just something he didn't use much when he could just blow things up. But with the number of mushrooms here... Anya would rather not see what a smoke made up of the sheer variety of mushrooms here would do. Delam watched the boar turn to him. Anya guessed it was bored chasing and running a target like herself. Come here and leave my team alone. He beckoned with his blade. This angered the animal. As it's furious, a stranger would dare to order it about. It smashed its foot into the ground and began to build up a charge. Delam's stance changed subtly, and he palmed his sword to the side, eyes never faltering. The ball let loose with a war cry of a challenge and rushed forward again, and the ground below its body exploding at the force. Ania had another arrow ready, but she knew better than to shoot it now. It might do more harm than good if Delam was ready for the attack. The ball's tusk looked like it was about to touch Delam, their eyes meeting as close as they could get and Delam shifted, sliding to the side and the ball as the tip of the blade dragged along the ball's side, the fire leaping eagerly into the musty hair of the beast. Sparks caught and the thing went up like a crackling inferno. Anaya felt her pride at Delam rise once again. The man's talent showed once again why he was the leader. Delam watched as the blade lost its fire after one attack. The ball stumbled as it roared with fury the fire gathering on its back. It seemed to fall to the ground for a moment as the flames reached their peak. Nia jumped down and readied her arrow as Delam moved to quickly end the creature. They had won. There was no need to make the thing suffer. 
No one here enjoyed that kind of sick thing. The sword swung down with a hint of finality. She eyed the screen. She just couldn't look away. They unlocked a mini-boss. Dalta choked as Sis beeped cheerfully as the conditions were revealed. Uh, that's sort of unfair. Dalta pointed out as she saw Bori's form explode with enough force to send the sword flying out of Dalton's hand. Bori of the Grove Guardian has unlocked a second form due to the unique purchases of the Grove and the burning condition. Bori has become... The size and shape were pretty much the same, but the mane along with the guardian's back was made of flames, rather than hair. The boar snorted out black smoke, and as it neared the gut rot mushrooms, the thing exploded with a small boom. A chorus of singers hit notes that reflected how demonic the scene looked. Delta had to ban Maestro from using songs in from that game. She didn't want to encourage that atmosphere. Raging fire main. If hit with a fire, Bori becomes a timid mini-boss that will perish after two minutes. Dalta stared at as any of the mushrooms that Bori neared were ignited. The starlight mushrooms letting out a dazzling sizzles. The gut rots exploded. The delicious mushrooms smelled really good. Still, Dalta could only watch helplessly as the awesome mushroom grove suddenly went from a mystical wonderland into a hellish inferno as Firemane charged with twin snorts of fire shooting out of his nose. Mr. Mushy walked cheerfully through the tavern. He had spent a good afternoon helping his brother make music, but now he wanted to go pet Bori and relax while he waited for new people. Mr. Mushy hoped that they would have some pots. Maybe he could show them a nice mushrooms that grew in his home. He was sure that they would like that. But that had his friend Mr. Bori. He closed his eyes in pleasure and excitement. He couldn't wait. End of chapter. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 73. Lord of Mushrooms. Fire. It was a force that promised the end of Mr. Mushy, but also gifted him the potential of his arts. Fire was a creature that he didn't understand that well, but all was too eager to give a chance. Swa had always made it seem so tame, so innocent. The fire that he saw now was not a friend that he had sought. The fire cruelly danced before Mr. Mushy as his home burned. Flames that formed his pots now devoured mushrooms. Heat that had been merry now beckoned the green and orange grove. The beauty of the flame had been taken over by the ugly scene before him. Mr. Mushy had no mouth, but he screamed inside from the rage not far away. Bori! He moved forward as the creature tried to trample the fallen form of a small human. The boar's lazy demeanor had been replaced by some endless madness tinged with rage. The gentle eyes of Mr.'s friend was gone, and the beast in its place saw nothing but targets. Mr. walked forward, feeling his cap singe from the heat, and the beast stomped down hard. But the fallen human was surrounded by white domes of magic. Bori bounced off of it without scratching its shield. Cammy, run! A high-pitched human yelled. The small one rose when Bori rammed the shield again. The white dome flashed, making Mr.'s friend fly back and crash through several burning mushroom stalks. Mr. noticed now how scared the human looked now that the dome had faded. He thought of Dio. He had never looked scared. The other boy, Grim, he had merely looked annoyed. But this girl looked scared. Mr. stumbled as the fire raged around him. Tiny mushrooms, the quiet ones, the ones that did not walk or move, exploded and crumbled into black soot as ash. Mr. was confused. Why? Why had everything become so horrible? He burst through another wave of heat as Bori stood, and his brush tackled Mr. to the ground, his mad eyes no longer seeing Mr. Mr.'s friend wasn't acting like a friend. Why? The word repeated over and over. Had Mr. done something wrong? Had the humans caused this? Had Bori lied about being his friend? Why? Fire. It had taken the first of his kind, the mushroom spitter, they who were not named, the sibling that was never was. Now fire had come for Mr.'s important people. The flickered white dome began to crack as Bori rammed it over and over. 
The girl inside screamed as her friends tried to wade past the exploding mushrooms and dancing frames. Bori screamed in rage. The girl screamed in fear. The grove screamed in pain. Everything was screaming. Mother was screaming. It needed to stop. He could hear Mother commanding someone else, which would be a good thing, but Mr. had to do something now. The girl's white sphere was beginning to gather power again, and Bori was struck by the magic again. He might be hurt beyond healing if he broke the shield. The girl would die and Mother would. Mr. would not accept this. The heat burned at him, and he squashed skin, and rounded limbs were pain, but he pushed into the eye of the firestorm. He narrowed his eyes. If his spots could take this heat and they themselves, then Mr. Mushy would strive to do the same. He charged. Cammy prayed that the shield would hold, and if that failed, it would buy them enough time as it ruptured to escape. The fire demon before her was frothing at its mouth and the mini bombs were off around it. The mushrooms, the air, the very room itself was not designed to cope or even work with the monster before her. Kemi had the oddest feeling that this was a bad outcome for the adventures as well as the dungeon. Still, she'd ponder that more as Ania peppered the boar with harder with arrows, the wooden things barely lasting more than a few seconds in the heat. The wards Kemi employed were based on her faith, and Kemi had faith in spades, but she herself had used up a lot of power so far. The ball rammed into her dome again, and the unstable substance of her faith raged back. Without control and restraint, the faith would explode into a howling fanaticism, explode in both the literal and symbolic sense. Holy magics worked best from the back rows, where the caster wasn't under duress. For that very reason, now that Kemi liked one choice over the other, it was to explode or be smashed. Gonga was too busy doing his best to filter the smoke and toxins away from the group to do anything about the raging fire. Ania lacked the expensive magical arrows to douse or freeze the fire, and well, Olida's sword was still starting this mess. Kemi gripped the symbol of faith and watched as a coming attack of the fire demon built up momentum. This was it. The ball would break, or Kemi would. This was the moment of truth. Kemi closed her eyes. Her escape was cut off by another falling flaming mushroom tree, this crashing noise only outdone by the explosions of the black mushrooms it crushed. Oddly, her last thought was not of the goddess prayer or the death, but concern for her friends. Ania would never have opened her heart again. Gonga would have another dark memory related to his magic. Her leader would take her falling as his own failure. How sad that her death would have so much trouble. Kemi's thoughts were halted as she expected sound of roaring magic did not come, but instead the noise of a pig impacting something oddly moist. Kemi snapped her eyes open and blinked. A mushroom man. The grove must have become so angry with the fire that it grew legs. The creature was between her and the fireball. One hand pushed with strain against the snout of the boar, and the other pushed against the shield, where the holy magic crackled and flared around the creature's fingers. The mushroom man pushed the demonic pig back and restrained her holy fury. Kemi looked up at the pained eyes. The look. Kemi stumbled back, gasping as the creature's eye showed confused agony. Kemi had the illogical urge to apologize, but a glint of deeper emotion shined through the pain. As the creature, no, as the being before Kemi pushed back his fellow monster and her empowered ward, the sheer will and determination, it, of all things, made Kemi feel safe. The mushroom man had a small, round eyes and a somewhat stubby fingers, but Kemi watched as he pushed the ball back with careful force and her shield cracked harder in response. Kemi bit her lip. Delta's dungeon, the dungeon of Jiren's. Everything. Kemi thought about everything that she'd seen since she'd set foot into this place, until the boar had been set on fire. Kemi had the sense that things weren't as they seemed. That something, that oddity and the weirdness of it all, was before her in a physical shape. The monster protecting her from another monster and protecting its friends from her shield. It wasn't normal, but it felt right. Kemi ignored the yelling of her friends and dropped her shield letting the energy of what was about to erupt just fade. 
Kemi took a leap of faith as she watched the monster before her eye. His fingers now able to reach over. Well, Kemi watched as it slowly nodded at her. Then it used both of its hands to push the ball back as the fire on the back of the ball began to splutter. Kemi felt the heat rush in as the magic faded, her team still struggling to push past the environmental danger to reach her. She flinched as another large mushroom fell near her and sparks splashed across her robe. The sparks hovered for a moment before they slowly floated backwards. What? Kemi whispered. It wasn't just those sparks, but soon the whole spheres of flame were peeling themselves off of the branches and the ground. Smoke and heat were lured away from Kemi and the surprisingly short span of time. The inferno of the grove had been reduced to a black fireball hovering over the clawed hand of a goblin. The steaming grove made a smaller form look dangerous as his mask and staff marked the goblin as different. Goblins came as warriors, scouts, shamans, and other. If it wasn't a chief, then any goblin that looked different was dangerous. Kemi gulped as the goblin neared, holding more fire than Gonga could handle on his best day. The mask was some horrid child's idea of a dragon. The dark straw skirt and the dark red pelt that closed the shaman, but the staff was charred black, and the tip was glowing like a tree being struck by lightning. Kemi felt safe with the mushroom man, but with this creature, she wanted to run. This fire stinks of human arrogance. Done? Done destroying everything? The goblin shrieked. Her team surrounded her. Ania and her leader readied their weapons, but Gonga hissed harshly at them. It's holding enough fire to crisp us. We're outclassed. I've never seen a goblin pyromancer. This one... He trailed off as the goblin shifted his mask to reveal a very pissed expression. This one doesn't like you. Get out. Get out! Before you hurt someone else, the goblin howled and the black staff spluttered with a dark fire. The mushroom man slowly lowered the ball to the ash-covered ground. It petted the creature's burned skin as the ball struggled to breathe. It is, Kami spoke up, and the goblin turned to her, and his eyes red, quickly hiding pain with fury. None of your concern. Well done, you just use one of ours to harm another. Mr. Mush's hands are burnt black. Bori is dying in eye. I want you out. The goblin ordered, voice so collateral and fireball so black that Kemi felt herself being pulled back by Gonga. Time to regroup. Ho lead. Dalim insisted. The mushroom, Mr. Mushy, it had a name, and it made everything so much worse. Mr. Mushy cradled the ball gently and rocked back and forth. The body expression, the movements, the image. Kemi felt ill. She felt like a monster right now. Ania tugged her hand and Kemi could see the confusion cover her best friend's face. Dalim was blank and gonga. Kemi had never seen him cry before. Delta felt deja vu as she watched Bori slowly fade from existence. Instead of feeling better or numb at seeing the creature die a second time, the scene only made Delta go over everything again. Where had she gone wrong? Too many explosive mushrooms, not enough signs. Bori's hidden form was a clue. She should have examined him closer. So many things, but it was also a lesson in itself. There wasn't going to be simple instances of good guys and bad guys. Delta liked the group that came in. Kemi was sweet. Ania acted tough, but Delta smiled when she saw the affection that the woman had for her team. Gonga was an idiot, and he made Delta laugh. Delum was polite. Everything had just gone wrong. Then something else went wrong. It was all because some innocent mushroom picking. More signs, more ideas. Shh. It's going to be okay, she said calmly, quietly as Mr. Mushy shook violently next to her. Swa eyed the dark fire before he squeezed his hand and smothered the flame. His palm burned badly, but the goblin walked onwards before Delta could chide him for acting so macho. Bori wheezed weakly. The fire form had utterly exhausted the poor thing. Delta wanted to use mana or something to help, but the group had only made it to the spider room. It seemed like they intended to leave for now. That was fine. On the bright side, she didn't have to add any names to her new memorial room. He's going to be okay. Bori will be back before you know it. 
Delta promised her mushroom. Mr. shook his head, sinking his fist into the ground in frustration. His beady eyes met hers. Delta had to look away. You can't blame yourself, she insisted, but Mr. Mushy stood and bore his body broke apart into an orange sparkles of manna. The item, a cloak made of fire mane's fur, stood out clearly. Mr. Mushy picked it up and held it aloft with anger. Shaking fists and hardened eyes seemed to settle on something. Mr. Mushy, she nudged with her voice, I cannot be a gentleman. The regretful tone hit Delta hard as the dungeon core powers focused entirely on Mr. Mushy and allowing her to heal, feel his existence. Mr. Mushy, one bad experience shouldn't make you want to quit, Delta replied quickly. To be honest, this was something that Delta would have to come to grips with on her own, as more people set foot into a dungeon, but she hadn't expected her monsters to overcome it first. Cannot be a gentleman. Selfish. Bori will not be forced to be not Bori. Delta was confused, but the sudden lack of people in a dungeon allowed her powers to be fully restored. New and sis as well. The menu immediately popped up. Mr. Mushy would like to take Bori, the guardian mini-boss status. Unknown effect, unknown outcome. Confirm. Mr. Mushy, you can't. This might make you stop being you. Delta said immediately. Mr. Mushy tilted his head. Mr. is only ever Mr. I believe that a gentleman would do this, even if I cannot become one. I'd like to act like one. Just this once. Delta's arguments deflated. She could feel New's heart stare in her back, but he didn't say anything. Please, don't change too much. She begged as she hit confirm. Silently, the monster before her raised a single thumb in promise. Then he began to glow with a deep blue aura. Maestro paused in his third row choir grooming as they were slightly off key. He turned to stare into the distance. Well, I'll be Mushy's brother, he mused. On the second floor, Missy paused as she broke up another fight between the stars and bloods. She blinked as something washed over her. She sat on the rock and sang a greeting to the power rose. Big brother, she chirped. All over the dungeon, mushrooms perked up and then went all still and the utter rule came over them all. Delta was only aware of the grove exploding like a techno laser party as Mr. Mushy's plump form was replaced by something a little different. The dying of the light only made Delta stare harder. The bowed head with a deep red cap ringed around the edge of the golden crown. The eyes that looked up to meet hers were still a little beady, but there was a slight dark marks to show the pupils of sorts. Mr. Mushy's bare and youthful face was now sported a flowing beard made from bungle threads. His body was cloaked in a deep red of fireman's fur, trimmed and tailored to make a royal coat. On the back was Delta's symbol. He stretched out one hand and the staff. No, a walking stick tapped the ground. It was crooked and knobbly with various mushrooms growing over it. The image was impressive, but still rather cute. It was Mr. Mushy still under the new accessories. After all, you look pretty impressive, Delta praised. I thank you, came an amused voice. Delta froze as Mr. Mushy stroked his beard and admired his stick. You talk, I mean out loud, she pointed out the obvious. Quite well, it seems. Not surprising, as I deeply desired a dignified form before, no? Mr. Mushy nodded sagely as Delta craned her neck to the information box. Mike and its sovereign, mini-boss, he who rules the caps. This mushroom has evolved with the aid to become a leader of various mushrooms. His mere presence in a room can cause many fungi to behave better. His cloak, made from the fire main spore, is resistant to fire damage and his staff leaks stun spores and other odd things. You can have one mini-boss every five floors. Sovereign, and you're not crazy. Delta smiled. Lose the scary, out-of-control fireball. Get a snazzy cool mushroom king. Win-win. Thank you, sis. Mother. Thank you for letting me take this on. I believe it is, uh, as you would say, a feather in my cap. He stroked his beard, pleased. Delta felt everything in her life just click into place. 
Mr. Mushy, she began, but her monster raised one hand. The new form requires a new name. I would think Lord Mushy would do just fine, but as you are the most important person in my life, you can call me Lordy. He winked with a pleased secret tone. What about me? Newsbox dinged in a question. Lordy stood up straight. We are fellow sirs. You are Sir New and I am Sir Lord Mushy. He nodded and New took a moment to answer. If you are Sir and Lord, I want there to be at least a Sir and a Master. Delta couldn't help but reveal a smile as the grove around them slowly rebuilt itself. From the ashes arose life. From the destruction of the fire and the charging boar came fresh mushrooms and beauty. She felt herself think of the adventurers, not the best first trip, but Delta would have to thank them for helping find a problem that would have arisen later at a worse time. Lord Mushy was talking about the fact that Lord was his name and not a title when all around them trumpets and horns blared as Maestro's power leaked into the room. Welcome one, welcome all to a very special day, the day that I, your gorgeous Maestro, gained the bragging right to be related to royalty. He laughed, and he does not know that I am more proud to be related to such a superstar, Lordy mused. You both are failures as monsters. Only this dungeon makes flipping superstars and lords. Where is my foaming ten-headed elemental dragon, or my evil woman who wears no clothes? In another dungeon, Nu. In another dungeon, Delta promised. She quietly didn't think about the third floor or any chances of gambling on rare moments. Just knowing her luck, she'd get a dragon and the demon but it was also knowing her track record. Delta was sure that she could make the dragon into a fashion critic and the demon into a chef. It was all the small things that Delta took pride in. Still, she knew that she had some work to do, figuring out if she had any other ticking boss monsters waiting for a dramatic entrance was number one. The second was to correct the issue with her first floor was a little fire hazardous. Who knew? The silence between them was loud. Kemi twitched as she slipped her apple cider. Ania drank some blue cocktail that she had in a fancy rimmed glass. It smelled of slime cores and perfume. Kemi wanted to try it when Ania had her back turned. She adjusted the web earmuffs, carefully feeding the item on any signs of reality degradation. Dungeon's items broke down outside of their home, but thankfully having a glass meant that Kemi could slow the process down greatly by replacing the breaking or fading manner with her own. If she was a tailor or master class or something close to it, she could instantly make the item permanent. Still, she did her best as the glossy earmuffs were really, really nice. Gonga looked sad as he was forced to drink his ale out of a bucket, he kept breaking or somehow losing his mugs, and the bartender had gotten quite irate. Delam went outside for a smoke, a habit Kemi hadn't seen before from Delam. The act made him real, and the effect was weird to the girl. Delam had always seemed like the unchanging and relaxed figure of the group. Silence was only slightly made worse by the woman. Kemi looked up from her glass and the dark-skinned woman with dark red eyes. The red orbs moved from glaring at Ania to Kemi. Maybe. Maybe Kemi should say something. Hi, my name is Kemi. She pushed out, and the noise was like a bear trap. The sound wrenching and dangerous. The woman's nostrils flared. Kemi. Nice name. The woman nodded as she drained her giant mug of something in a single gulp. So, since you're the only one talking, and I can't help noticing that you've got a lovely pair of spiderweb earmuffs, gonna hazard a guess that you folks are a lot that went into Delta's. She asked. The way that she said the name of the dungeon with familiarity made Kemi's warning senses tingle a little. She touched the muffs gingerly. Yes, we're the Scholar Moons, the, uh, adventurers, Kemi introduced. She saw Ania had gone from ignoring the threat to actively sizing her up in Kemi's defense. The woman licked her lips dry of her drink. Listen, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Did you hurt her? Did you kill her monsters? Or did you hurt Dalton? The woman questioned bluntly. The bar around them went quiet as the woman raised her voice. A blonde man with a scruffy beard and howled eyes stood nearby watching the scene and the woman intently. 
kill them? That place is insane. Ania stood and slammed her hands on the table. Kimmy put her hand on her arm. Gonga's massive arms tensed. Being sent running and licking the wounds made Kenny's friends sore, and she knew that this was the last thing that they needed. Besides, Kemi finally found something that she had been looking for since coming to this town. Someone willing to talk about the dungeon. Delta isn't... She isn't a normal dungeon, right? She forced the giant woman to look at her again. Her chest ached, Kemi's mind pushing that image of the mushroom man in pain. The way it had put itself between her and the boar, the duck that had been sweet, the ghostly spider that could have killed them all. Delta doesn't want to kill us, does she? She's aware, but she only has two or three flaws. Everything was fine until we made it harder. That's why everything was my fault. Kemi trailed off and stood in a slow motion. Girl, Kemi, listen. The woman stood as well to easily tower over her. My name is Rudy, and I'm sort of making friends with Delta. So sorry I'm a bit of a... my mother. But if you did something, Delta is most likely going to be fine. She is a great person, to a fault, Rudy stressed. Perhaps Rudy saw the pain in Kemi was feeling, or noticed how the rest of her friends were trying to keep her away from everything else. Kemi looked her ahead. I had ideas. I did something horrible. And Kemi announced and looked at the group and Delam walked back in. I knew Delta, the dungeon, wasn't acting like what you'd expected, and I saw how nice things were being. I kept it mostly to myself. I didn't share my thoughts because I wanted to show how serious I was at being a part of the group. I didn't express my truth. It hit under my doubt, and now Delta suffered. I got overexcited and I was the one who started the fight in the grove by deciding that I could just take things. Kemi said calmly, Hun, it's a dungeon. Take things as part of the whole concept. You had some ideas, but you know, without seeing more, your suspicions was just that. Ideas. Ania tried to soothe her, but Kemi reached inside her robe and pulled out a golden hand of her devotion. If I find the truth, then I must follow the truth. If it becomes a lie, then I must better myself. She repeated for the basic core of her faith. She had no evidence to suggest that Delta was dangerous, but she had more evidence to support the other point of view. But now everything was confusing and Kemi didn't know how to feel. The warmth of the earmuffs mingled with the lingering smoke in her nose from the burning grove. Which was the real Delta? Kemi wanted to believe that the kind and unique dungeon over the one that would wait for them to drop their guard. But with how she was feeling, the boiling sea of frustration and uncertainty, there was only one thing to do. Dalem, I'm going to do a seek. She said and the man's face turned ashen. Rudy's anger was gone and in its place was confusion. In a dungeon? That's suicide. Hania pushed her chair so hard that it toppled to the floor. Kemi's eyes swung to her and she could feel the power of her faith growing as the decision was made. Ania, I'm going to seek the truth. I will see you in the morning. I'll meet you at the end. She said and walked out to the door. Her sister in battle and friends sat down in a pained expression. Della moved aside without a question. They had done the stance before and Kimmy was about to leave when the giant woman, Ruli, halted her with a single hand on her shoulder. Maybe you should take it easy and listen to your friends. She advised, but the woman's fingers seemed to steam just a little. Kemi bowed her head. Sorry, I mean no offense, but I have chosen my path, she smiled. I'm just doing this to give Delta a chance. Is that okay? She pressed, Ruli removed her reddened fingers and hesitated. This is mighty kind of you, but what exactly are you going to do? She asked as she held the door open for her. Kemi had to admit she sort of enjoyed the looks of the people's faces when she explained this bit. I'm going to put on a blindfold and walk into a straight line and hope not to die. She beamed and skipped out of the tavern. Rudy's face was going to keep her giggling for days to come. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. 
and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.